versus New York, London versus Singapore, Hong Kong, and maybe eventually Shanghai. That's probably where the attention is, as opposed to London versus Amsterdam, Paris, or Frankfurt. Many of the factors that are positive for the city are, in fact, Brexit-proof. Language, time zone, very importantly, English law, and, of course, the skills, the knowledge, and the infrastructure that is found here in London. But it's interesting to note how the debate has evolved over the last 20 months. 20 months ago, in the immediate wake of the referendum, the two key focuses of attention were on passporting and clearing. The fear being that both of those would cause problems for London. But passporting, in its current format, only came into effect in 2007. It's led to a change in some business models, but it's not been the factor that has allowed London to remain or be the global financial centre. Also, there's been a change in thinking regarding clearing, as it's been seen that a fragmentation of the clearing market would not help anyone. Instead, the debate has moved towards mutual recognition and enhanced equivalence. And in that environment, what's been most positive, maybe, from a UK perspective, is the way attitudes on the continent have shifted in the recognition <coughs> that Europe needs a major capital market and there's no one else that can fill the gap at the moment. That being said, a big challenge, and maybe it's a challenge that was finally, only finally addressed yesterday, is about citizens' rights. One in eight people who works here in the city is an EU national from outside the UK. So the fact that it's taken 20 months until finally resolving the issue yesterday has been an ongoing problem for the city. But overall, to conclude the first part, the real message when one talks to different firms is that whilst one or two of them have their business model that might need to adjust, for them the key issue is where will the market be in the future and where will clients want to do their business. And that environment has led, as I've said, to a significant shift in thinking over the last 20 months. And it leads on to the second part, how technology is starting to play an increasing role. Technology and the city. Whoever one speaks to, there tends to be an acceptance that there's greater future interaction between technology and finance. The two are becoming intertwined in many different areas of the financial system. And over the last 20 months, probably the most positive development was the decision taken by the big tech firms, led initially by Google, but followed very quickly by the others, to proceed with and increase their investment in the city of London well, not just the City of London, but in London generally. Many of the factors that make London Brexit proof, proof are behind that, but also there has to be the vibe factor. London is the only global city in Western Europe, and outside of Silicon Valley, there's not many other places that could sort of attract the tech people in the way in which London has. No one should be complacent. Other people would try and grab a slice of the action. But there's very much a feeling when one talks to tech people that there's an opportunity with Brexit to reposition the UK in the global economy. And importantly, it's about the fourth industrial revolution and how you can position yourself in it. Now, to give them credit, the government, and indeed before this government, the coalition government, started to take many features or take many actions to create a more enabling environment for the tech industry based here in the UK. Yesterday, if you were at the event across the road in the Guildhall, uh, the city minister, uh, Mr Glenn, commented that the tech industry is £7 billion in size, has 60,000 jobs and 1.6 thousand firms. In fact, those figures are probably 15 months out of date, and if anything, they're higher, not lower. The Chancellor last year announced a national productivity fund of £23 billion. Productivity has been low in the UK, probably not best measured here in the UK, given we're a service sector economy. But in that new fund, some, not all, but some, is being allocated towards the tech area. In addition, the UK government is about to announce a financial sector strategy. But already many things have happened. In 2015, for instance, a payment system regulator was set up here in the UK. In 2017, the Bank of England announced the FinTech Accelerator to provide innovative ways in which central banking could evolve in the future. And on top of that, the UK government and the city, Corporation of London and the other parts that make up the city, have started to really play a more pro-global, pro proactive role. Last year, for instance, there was a UK-India FinTech conference in Mumbai, and there are specific 
actions that have taken place and deals, shall we say, that have been done between the UK and China, UK, South Korea, UK, Singapore. For instance, this year we saw the UK-China Financial Security City Project in Xiongyang. And on top of all that, one has to say tax is becoming a very important area uh, for the tech industry. Uh, some politicians don't like that. The UK corporation tax rate has already fallen significantly in recent years from 28 to 19 percent and is set to fall further to 17 percent. So all of this is about creating an enabling environment for tech to be attracted to the UK, including London. The third part is what about tech itself? Obviously there will be experts talking on the panel, but using my macroeconomic hat, shall we say, <clears throat> um, I think we can look at this in a generic way, but also from the perspective of the suppliers of the tech, the customers who use the tech in finance, and the financial industry itself. And maybe the big message is to embrace change. If you were here in the 19th century, uh, many different debates took place in the city in the 19th century. Fascinating if you read through the history of it. But technology was a big one at one stage. Ledgers was in the middle of the 19th century. Now we have distributive ledgers and, of course, blockchain. But maybe best highlighted by a speech Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, gave at the big mansion house dinner in 2016. To quote from it, he said, FinTech has the potential to deliver more resilient financial infrastructure, a more effective trade and settlement, and new ways to encode, share, and analyze data. And he's right. Take it from the perspective of the providers or the suppliers of financial technology. There are six major areas of financial world that will be impacted directly and also indirectly by technology. Payment system, lending, retail banking, transaction settlement, insurance and wealth management. New entrants help disintermediate the market. They transform it, things are done speedier, customers and businesses connect with each other far better. You could say it's a revolution, but in many respects it's an evolution. It's continuing what we've already seen over the decades. It's diverse, it's resilient and it's effective. It also poses challenges for the incumbents. Uh, the regulatory environment in recent years outside of technology has been like a pendulum. Before the financial crisis it was too light, now it's swung to the other extreme too heavy. And that regulatory environment in some respects has provided a shield for the incumbents in the financial industry. They thought the high regulatory barriers would now pose challenges, challenges for new entrants. Technology in some respects is pulling down those barriers. So the incumbents have to respond. They have to invest, they have to innovate, or they have to buy up the new players, the new entrants to the block. It's good news for the consumers. One of my roles, I'm, I have a number of portfolio roles, as Ginny mentioned, I'm with Bank of China, board up the road. But I'm also involved with Net Wealth Investments, which is an online discre discretionary wealth manager. And in some respects, we're FinTech, uh, or we don't describe ourselves as FinTech. We've got technology, that allows you to start afresh. Um, the financial side, we're basically all people who use to work in the financial industry. The fees we charge people in the discretionary wealth world are a third of the industry average. And basically the key message is that technology allows you to control the controllables. Time in the market, I suppose the time in the market, diversify portfolios, but it's about um, making things not just cheaper, but more efficient and easier and better value. So I've seen at first hand how technology is allowing finance to change. For the consumer, it's not just about cheaper access to things. There's also a wider social economic role. Technology is going to allow finance to become more inclusive. People will be better connected. They will be more informed. And increasingly, they will be empowered. What does it mean for the industry as well? The other part of the triangle, in addition to the suppliers and the consumers, is the industry. The Financial Stability Board has echoed many of these positive trends. They've talked about an industry that's going to become more inclusive, efficient, effective and resilient. Now, the Bank of England, not the role, and any other central bank have a number of key objectives. Stability and supervision of the financial system are included. It's seen that technology will allow supervisors 
to have a better control over the system and to supervise more efficiently what's happening. Competition is going to lead to faster settlement and more efficient capital allocation. In terms of stability, there will be a big positive. Uh, the more diverse business models that technology allows to come into the market will provide alternative pr provision of financial services. That's good for stability. On the downside, however, again highlighted by the Financial Stability Board, is that the digital data revolution, use of algorithms and computers, creates a hidden challenge. Many people are now starting to use third-party data sources, looking for correlations which might not be driven by theory, and it's leading to crowded trades and herd-like behaviour. So there is a positive in terms of financial stability with new entrants and better provision, but there's a challenge as well. And to conclude from an industry perspective, reg tech is now very much on the scene and again is a big thing here in London. It's technology-driven regulation. So to conclude, what does it mean for China? It's 40 years this year, as we all know, since the opening up of China. China faces many challenges, as we've heard from the last few days, and indeed in Davos earlier this year. Poverty, pollution, and prevention of risks. But there's an underlying positive, which is that China is moving to the next stage of development. In its first stage, it very much favoured, shall we say, Germany, exporter of investment and capital goods. There's now an acceptance when one visits Beijing or Shanghai that the next stage of development helps other countries, particularly the UK, with our provision of business professional financial services. China needs to actually attract those to China. London provides a very important bridge in terms of technology. But also China will be seeking continuously to invest overseas and build up its overseas assets and its overseas position. China needs to invest in terms of asset-seeking investments, brand-seeking investments, and technology-seeking investments. So it's not just going to be London exporting tech and other types of fintech to China. It's also going to be China putting investment here in the UK. In my view, that suggests a strong future relationship between China and the UK, not only in this area, but in many other areas as well. Thank you for your time, but just to conclude, I think that Brexit suggests that London will remain the major financial centre. Second, technology suggests that London is going to be the fintech centre of the world, and technology will impact and intersect with many different areas of the financial system. Providers, consumers, the system itself, and I think China has much to learn, much to contribute, and the UK and China much to cooperate in, in this area in the future. Thank you.